Hello and welcome to Socialism, the weekly Marxist podcast from the Socialist Party. Schools in Britain are part closing, workers in almost every sector are being sent home with or without pay, and there are shortages of equipment for safe and hygienic work in everywhere. The day after we recorded this podcast on the 19th of March 2020, the government was due to announce plans to support workers. But whatever is promised, the track record so far is that workers everywhere are pulling out all the stops to fight the pandemic while big businesses and their politicians only seem interested in their bottom lines. What should workers demand to solve these problems? Was the Trade Union Congress right to declare for national unity with the employers and the government? And how can workers make sure their interests are looked after in this period, whether or not they're in a union? The coronavirus pandemic is a rapidly escalating global crisis, affecting every part of the capitalist system. As well as following this weekly podcast, you should check the Socialist Party's website, socialistparty.org.uk, and our Facebook page for regular statements on working class demands, socialist analysis, and reports from the front line. This episode of Socialism looks at the COVID 19 pandemic, workers' rights during coronavirus. This episode, we're going to be speaking with Rob Williams, who's one of the Socialist Party's industrial organisers. Hello, Rob. Hello. And Glenn Kelly, one of the Socialist Party's other industrial organisers. Hello, Glenn. Afternoon. So, there's a whole number of topics we're going to discuss about how the coronavirus crisis is affecting workers and how the trade unions should respond to that. But immediately in Britain, yesterday evening, the Education Secretary announced that within 48 hours the schools were going to close. This is going to have a big impact on school workers, but also on a whole load of workers in other industries who now have to look after children who are not going to be in school. Glenn, how should the trade unions respond to this situation? Well, I think first and foremost we have to say that Johnson and the Tories have been forced in from pressure from below from trade unions like the National Education Union and from what was happening on the ground. Something that they should have planned and organised has now left every parent and every teacher in the land literally got 48 hours to plan for what is now being predicted for no education on a mass scale up until September. We understand literally as of today plans are being drawn up and discussions taking place. It is vital in our view that to ensure and relieve every parent of any anxiety immediately the government should extend the current legal rights to emergency parental leave so that it is with full pay and that that full pay would remain for the further notice so that no parent should worry if Monday morning their child's at home that they will be guaranteed pay. And to be honest, what in reality this is showing up is those that Johnson only a few months ago referred to as low-paid and unskilled workers uh, suddenly now are showing that they're the real backbone of our economy. And frankly, if Boris Johnson don't go to work tomorrow, who'd notice? (laughs) But if every teacher, every parent, in effect, is not at work, then the economy comes to a standstill and what's clear in terms of the schools now that the trade unions need to have a key role in oversight of determining what children are going to be provided with education what support that they can be given what workers will be needed to be at work and what resources are required already some schools have been planning for online teaching aids for pupils so they can carry on learning over the next couple of months but it's no good having online services unless you can guarantee that every child has access to the internet and therefore Johnson should immediately instruct every internet provider that you've got to provide free broadband and if they refuse frankly it should take emergency powers to bring them into public ownership. We need to see that the trade unions are in effect organised and have control over what is taking place. In my view, in every school, they should immediately be ensuring that there's a union rep in the school, that there's organised proper health and safety plan, and that the local authorities should immediately guarantee the release of all the union secretaries on full-time release so they can support their members. And certainly my experience with school workers at the moment 
is they are willing to bend over backwards to ensure that those children of nurses, doctors, carers, etc., are provided with support. Well, that goodwill has to be met from the employers as well. We can't have, in effect, on the one hand, the unions declaring industrial truce on their part during this crisis, but employers still threatening redundancies, still threatening disciplinaries and sicknesses. We have to, and the unions have to demand immediately that every restructuring, every redundancy, every academy conversion are immediately halted, that disciplinary and sickness cases should be suspended at this moment in time. And those measures have got to be in place because we can't have it. The workers are dragging themselves into work, putting, frankly, their own health and safety at risk mm. and yet could still be faced with the sack because of budget cuts in local authorities. So the Easter holidays were due to be coming up quite soon anyway. What rights should school workers have during those? Well, obviously, most workers would have been expecting that in schools that they wouldn't be at work after Friday the 3rd of April because of the Easter holidays. We understand today that, in fact, they're looking to keep schools open during the Easter period. We have to be absolutely clear that it can only be on a voluntary basis of workers being able and willing to volunteer. There cannot be any compulsion of making school workers have to attend during the school holidays. We also need to ensure that the schools are a safe place to work, and that means ensuring schools have deep cleans, in my view, proper cleans, that it means that, frankly, there should be immediate testing for all school workers, And there has to be a proper drawn up guaranteed list of what school workers themselves might be vulnerable or caring for vulnerable people so that they can't be compelled to be working over the next period. And this would mean that there could be some staffing shortages. And by the way, on this issue of there not being sufficient protective equipment, sufficient testing, this is something which is affecting NHS workers even worse. So some people might ask, well, shouldn't priority be given to them if there's not enough resources? How should we respond to that? Well, of course, the government has to requisition any resources that are required. It is shocking to see the pictures of some of the PPE equipment that hospital workers have got let alone if you happen to be a school worker or bin worker or whatever, that equipment must immediately be provided. In terms of the undoubted shortages that will exist, then already you know, schools were starting to close because of staff going off sick or having to care, we would say that every local authority should immediately re-establish a supply agency run by the local authority that would be able to have a pool of staff in a local area that could be used to be sent in and guaranteed that they were paid on proper school teachers and support staff paying conditions. So there have been strikes by bin workers in London who haven't had access to hand sanitizers who have had to be taken out, bin bags full of potentially contaminated material from people who are self-isolating, possibly having the disease, and they've been demanding that there be hand sanitizers provided. Glenn has already spoken about the appalling position which there is in the NHS. We propose the requisitioning of private industry and, if necessary, the retooling of plants in order to produce hand sanitizer. For example, certain brewers have demonstrated it's possible for them to produce hand sanitizer. We've also seen the need for ventilating equipment. We need to requisition plants which could provide these sorts of things. We need to abolish the trade secrets, the intellectual property, which means that individual firms can profit out of them so that they can be produced more generally. But these are demands which we're putting on the government. In terms of fighting for safe and hygienic workplaces, what sort of demands should the trade unions be putting forward? Well, I think where you start from, isn't it, is that there is going to be, and I think there is, huge pressure on the unions to act in the so-called national interest here. Well, and actually, let's just talk about that for a second then, because you have had the Trade Union Congress, which is the umbrella organisation bringing together all of Britain's trade unions, the TUC, has very recently published a statement, and it seems it's got quite a lot of useful information in it, even some of the demands the TUC is putting on the government, we would approve of. They're quite positive, they're certainly steps forward. But at the end, it comes to this point. Bring together, step five, bring together unions and employers to help the national effort. Well, Glenn has just been raising, Rob, that actually 
we can't have a situation where there is truce declared by the trade unions, but the employers continue pressing their own interests against the workers, taking advantage of the goodwill of workers who are desperate to do whatever is necessary to pull us out of this crisis. We can't have the bosses ripping us off during that period. So do you think the TUC is right to put forward this idea of national unity? No, what the unions can't give up is their right and their ability to act in the interests of their members. Because obviously what we regard as the national interest, I'm sure if we said to the average worker, they would say, how can I act in the interest of the majority of society to ensure that, you know, workers, young people, old people, etc., that we're all protected, that we can all go about our daily life in a very secure way and a healthy way. But of course, that is not what Boris Johnson thinks. That's not what the people he represents mm. think in that way. What they see as the national interests is really the interests of the rich and the powerful. And of course, Boris Johnson represents those interests. Those are the people who supported him in the general election. Those are the people who made sure that the Tories had a record amount of big business finance behind them, his policies. Don't forget that the Queen's speech... Johnson outlined even more anti-union legislation mm. in this country, targeted explicitly at the rail and transport unions. Well, my started position would be, you take that off the agenda. You take the undemocratic anti-union laws. The laws, of course, that are brought in by Cameron. That means the trade unions are the only organisation in society that has to have at least a 50% turnout. You know, the mayoral and council elections have been postponed for a year, but there wouldn't be a council elected in this country if they had to comply with the same legislation as the trade union. So the truth is, is that I think workers naturally feel they want to do the best they can, and of course they are, to make sure the majority in society are kept safe and well and provided for. But of course, at the moment, it's a very one-sided track, isn't it? We've heard, just before we started this podcast, that there are bus workers in the south of England that have been told that from next Tuesday onwards they are being laid off with no pay. We've heard reports of bus drivers crying in work, wondering how they're going to provide for their families. And, and of course, we've heard many other stories, actually. Workers who've got even less protections, even less trade union organisation in that way. And therefore, as long as workers are being targeted in that way, they cannot give up their right to protect themselves. The Department of Transport has issued a statement with the unions, which sounds very laudable, you know, it's very good in that way. The ink isn't dry, if you like, on that statement. If you wanted a blatant example of how the capitalists, even in this crisis, will act in their interest, look at Richard Branson, with the one hand holding his hand out to the government, demanding £7 billion of taxpayers' money to be handed over to him, and yet announcing that thousands of his workers to be sent home for eight weeks on no pay. We're absolutely clear in the Socialist Party, any worker laid off, short-term or full-term, should be entitled to their full take-home pay, and the big companies should be made to pay that money. If any small business generally couldn't afford that, of course, then the government should look to pay that money. But we can't have a situation where companies literally allowed to shed their workforces overnight while still making billions of pounds in profits. Because as well as the economic question for those workers, by the way, it becomes a public health question. That eight weeks of unpaid leave, which Branson is foisting on his workers, that's going to be spread out over six months. So they know that's coming down the line. They're not going to be wanting to take sick leave when they are getting their full pay because they can't afford to lose more money out of that. You're going to have ground crew, you're going to have cabin crew potentially who are going to be coming into work sick. And this is true across all employers. Even these, what look like measures to mitigate it by the employers, really is robbing the workers. And in doing so, it's increasing the risk of the virus spreading. So it's completely counterproductive to controlling the epidemic. But that's £7.5 billion Branson is demanding, by the way. What a price for that airline. And what does the public get out of it at the end? Seven and a half billion pounds from the public purse. We don't even own the airline at the end well, of it. Well, don't forget that Branson made absolute billions of pounds off his ownership, if you like, of West Coast Mainline, mm. which he's now lost. But he, he earned a huge amount out of that. Many, much of it, by the way, through government subsidy. And incidentally, this statement that's been made by the Department of Transport and the Transport Unions, it says, Transport Ministers have pledged to work tirelessly 
with the unions to support staff in the transport industry through not only the media challenges, but also the issues that will affect the sector once the country has overcome this pandemic. Well, there you are. There's two tests in it. Workers who are working for, you know, Virgin Airline, these bus drivers in the south of England, where's the cooperation? Where's the unity? But in our position, as quite clear as Glenn said, workers should be paid their full pay, whether they're self-isolating, whether they're ill, whether they've been laid off. This isn't a crisis of their making. And if those companies are not able, willing or prepared to do that, then they should be immediately taken into public ownership. And really what this reveals, doesn't it, is that I would argue war workers aren't essential in a way, but particularly we talk about health and education, we talk about other workers as well, transport workers have a vital role to play. You know, who gets those essential workers to work in a period like this? And the truth is you cannot rely on private interests, you can't rely on those companies whose primary motive is to make profit, to run those essential services. And that's been revealed right across society, actually. You know, when you go into healthcare, you know, I mean, the most extreme version we've seen is talk of Trump trying to corner the market, if you like, for a vaccine Mm. for American companies. So what? So they can then sell those at expensive prices to people across the world. We can't rely on private companies and really, the big lesson of this is is that they have to be taken into public ownership for the interests of the majority in society. And by the way, Richard Branson also has interests in healthcare in Britain, mm, Virgin, Virgin Care. Healthcare. A couple of years ago, Virgin Care had accrued about £2 billion worth of NHS contracts. The rail franchises, which you mentioned, Rob, last year, those had paid out over £300 million just in dividends. There is no reason for these things to continue to be making profits for the private island owning billionaire Richard Branson. They should simply go into public ownership with not a penny further paid to him. He's had plenty of the public purse already. And those resources, and in other similar industries, could be mobilised to help us contain this virus at this time. Well, well, you can see that in terms of the debate around private hospitals and private hospital beds. Even in Spain, with hardly a left-wing government in effect, has requisitioned private hospital beds. In England, they're talking about buying them off them. In fact, there are some hotel chains rubbing their hands with glee because they've got no one staying in their hotels at the moment, offering themselves supposedly altruistically, you can use our rooms for hospital beds. But of course, seeing pound note signs going up in their minds in order to make a killing, it's a sort of certain iron law that the rich and powerful always seem to make money out of a crisis and it's working class people who are made to pay. And this really does expose who really does the real work in society, who can really plan for the needs of ordinary people. It's workers on the ground. And we have to make sure that it is organisation in our defence, in our protection of our safety and well-being, and not in protecting the interests of the wealthy and powerful. Can I just say, by the way, that clearly we're in a socialist society and we are not pretending that even under a socialist society you won't have things like this developing. You know, you like to think in a rationally planned society running the interest of the majority, they could be mitigated as much as possible. But the fact is, how would you deal with a crisis like this? Let's be blunt about it. When Johnson has been behind the curve all the way through. They they first knew about the developing pandemic before Christmas. It was certainly became clear at the very beginning of the new year what was taking place in China. They've had no preparation in place whatsoever. They've been caught short every step. And, of course, every statement they've made has been proved to be totally out of date literally a day later, the latest being the issue of the school's closures. Whereas... If you were a society that was running the interest of the majority, where you had public ownership of the pharmaceutical companies, the NHS, you got rid of the privateers, you had a proper socialist plan of production, but also of running society, then you didn't have any vested interest, private vested interest, then the response would be far better. Instead, what we have at the moment is total chaos, total disorganisation. People have seen people queuing outside supermarkets, Mm panic buying you could do your best to mitigate that type of thing and of course you know the government says out one corner of its mouth you know we're against panic buying 
And secondly, there's rumours flying around that London's going to be imminently locked down. Who in right mind would blame anyone for panicking in that instance? But I think the big thing, to return to the question you asked about the TUC, mm. see, I think in some respect there's a certain comparison to a war mm-hmm. in this situation, you know, and the same things are being evoked. You can imagine, when you look back at the First World War, when, in reality, the leadership of the Labour and Trade Union movement, in a big part, capitulated to, again, not the national interest, but to the interests of the capitalists, the big business and the rich and the powerful establishment. And you can see here that there's a huge pressure on the unions to give up on its rights, if you like. You know, that's not correct in this instance to talk of disputes. Well, of course, the point we always make is workers don't lightly go down the road of, you know, considering strike action, etc., etc. They do it for very good reasons. And, of course, in this period, they're because of attacks by the employers, low wages, etc. And the example you give, went down the bin workers yesterday in Bexley in South London. Fantastic dispute. Got brave bin workers facing up to intimidation by the police and the employer. Again, outsourced workers working Mm -hmm. for Circo, a company with a real reputation as far as workers are concerned in the NHS and other parts of the public sector. But these are bin workers. Look at the job they've got at the moment, you know, with the crisis. I would argue they're essential workers in that way, Mm. forced into taking strike action. One of the issues they were raising was about their own protection. Mm -hmm. Well, if they haven't been prepared to take that action, it looks like, by the way, they've achieved some key issues that they wanted resolved. They've won some demands. But would they have been able to win those without taking action? Of course they wouldn't have. No. And therefore, what do we say to workers who have got big issues? Like, for instance, those bus drivers in the south of England. What do we say to those workers? Well, you should just take it on the chin that the employer wants to take all your pay away from you and wants to affect your income, etc., damage the prospects of your family. No, we don't. The unions, it is absolutely essential that they retain their independence, their right to act in the interests of their members. The CWU, yes, they have got bitter experience of the pro-capitalist, pro-bosses legal system that we have, you know, smashed the anti-union, undemocratic voting thresholds in the autumn. So this is the postal workers? The the Royal Mail workers. They had an establishment high court judge who totally undemocratically ruled against them. They reballoted their members, won another fantastic victory in that ballot. 95% and, and for strikes. Incredible, just a two-week period of balloting. But of course, understandably, they have won that ballot, and of course now it's in the middle of this serious crisis over coronavirus. And what they did was, they went to Royal Mail and the government and said, OK, you treat us, if you like, like emergency workers, because we've got an important role To play, we are aware of the crisis that's emerging. They've put the ball in the court of Royal Mail and said, well, you know, are we acting together in the interests of everyone in society? We'll see the colour of the money of Royal Mail. And I think that's the issue. It's the last thing the workers would want to do anyway. But of course, in a period like this, it's the last thing the workers want to do is take action. But of course, if they are being threatened by management, what option have they got Mm. but to take action? And it's important that the TUC and the trade union send a clear signal to workers, one, of the rights the workers have, two, of what workers need in a period like this, but three, that if necessary, they are prepared to lead workers into action to get what is necessary for them and the wider working class and the wider layers of society. Because who looks after the actual public interest, if you like? The bosses and the politicians who represent big business they are trying to balance between the needs of public health and the needs of the bottom line, the profit motive. And those are irreconcilable a lot of the time. So this is why in Detroit, for example, bus workers have said, look, you've got to clean the buses, you've got to provide us with protective equipment, otherwise not only are we not safe, but people taking the public transport aren't safe. And it wasn't going to happen until they went out on strike and in less than a day they won some of their demands. And that is because workers collectively haven't got to chase the profit interest. They only have to look after their own collective interests, which in a period like this, in fact in all periods, are the interests of society at large rather than the interests of profit. Well, I'll give an example, isn't it? This example that we quote in, this bus company in the south of England, in that instance, we are really 
in the eye of the storm as far as the coronavirus is concerned. But that company is not thinking about the welfare of its workers. They're yeah. not thinking about the welfare of people who need to get to work. They're immediately thinking about the bottom line. They're immediately thinking, how can we ensure that at the end of this process, we stay in a profit-driven situation? Whereas those drivers, I bet are not thinking like that at all. The mm-hmm. drivers have a totally different attitude to this crisis. But the point is, in normal times or exceptional times, unless workers are prepared to take action, then unfortunately there are very few bosses who through sensible consideration come to the right conclusion. And therefore, what the unions cannot do at this stage is send any signal that they're not prepared to act when necessary in this period. It is an exceptional period, but in some respects that's even more important that the unions are prepared to act when necessary. I think alongside the unions as well, particularly with public services, there's an important role that Labour councils could play at this moment in time. Okay, go on. In my view, despite the budget cuts that many of them have just passed, they should immediately put a stop to any of those cuts, which will hit frontline services. One in ten councils have said that they will be under their current budgets that they passed in February will be cutting frontline services. That, at this point in time, is likely to lead to more desperation, frankly, potentially more deaths, and therefore they should immediately stop all budget cuts taking place. What better time now for Labour councils to make a stand to say this far or no further, we are not making a penny more cut. We'll draft up the budgets of what we need to meet the needs of our community, not just in this crisis in general, and demand that the government can cough up that money. If Johnson can cough up, and the Treasurer can cough up £330 billion on Monday of this week, when we were told there's no magic money tree (laughs) for big business, Mm -hmm. then local councils have a right, public services have a right, the NHS have a right to say, we're presenting with our bill that will protect the people of our nations, not just for this crisis, but beyond. Because that's the only way of guarantee and secure. And so there's a real role here of taking a stand. And that even in their last dying days, in a sense, Corbyn and Macdonald should be making that call to Labour councils now, in my view. And frankly, if they're not willing to do that fight, then they should step aside for those who are. Doesn't it show, though, James, that this is the second time, isn't it, in, what, 12, 13 years now, where capitalism, and on a world scale, has faced huge crises and, of course, a huge financial and economic crisis as well. And on two occasions, in the midst of those crises, they have turned to the, the language, if you like, of the socialist movement, in a sense, of nationalisation, public ownership, state intervention, etc., in those emergencies. Now, of course, as we've said many times, socialism for the rich, if you like, bailing out the failed banks and finance companies to the moment they're okay then to give them back to the private sector but of course it won't be lost and we want to make the point that workers will be asking more and more now well if that's good for the emergency times why isn't it good for the normal times and Mm. why actually we would take in a totally different direction and say actually rather than uh, like say an emergency and done in the interests of the rich and powerful if we had a society where that was the norm that was the day-to-day experience that you know, the economy was publicly owned. And that it was under democratic workers' control as Ex- well. Exactly, that, that afforded a socialist plan of production that could deal with those issues. You could see how the major issues that face ordinary people in so-called normal or exceptional times, you know, it's far greater possibility of dealing with those situations. But of course, in the main, dealing with workers' fears about housing, health, education employment etc you know opens up a totally different way of running things so hopefully that won't be lost on workers during this crisis and right now the taps are on so workers who need resources to shore up their personal financial situations and those of their families and also resources to stop the spread of the virus now is the time to demand them because the government has indicated okay the money is there yeah absolutely johnson has said I'll do whatever it takes. Well, fine. Then the workers should be literally 
drawing up the plans of what would be required in this immediate situation to protect not only their own rights, their own interests, but the service that they run and present that bill. And particularly in the public sector, the council could play a key role of saying, fine, we will use our borrowing powers, our reserves, and we will present that bill. And then put Johnson on the spot to say, you found money for the bank as you found money for business. Here's our bill now for the working class of this country, and therefore we demand it to repay. And to be honest, if they refused in these circumstances, you know, all hell would be letting loose. If there are not sufficient resources, could you start to see riots, either things like access to health care, to medicine, to food? Wouldn't it be better for the trade unions to indicate a constructive way forward to fight? What should workers, who may or may not be in a trade union actually, most workers, particularly younger workers and workers in the newer industries, are not directly organised by a trade union these days, but these are unprecedented times. What should workers face with these kinds of issues at work, whether or not they're in a union, what action should they take now? Well, can I just say, look... When you rightly said that there is obviously the danger of all sorts of developments, you know, looting, it's organisation, isn't it? Mm. There would be a difference in a situation where people can't get enough goods that they desperately need in workers organising that than, than looting. I think the big thing is, is that the danger of the TUC statement is if you give an impression that, quote, we're all in it together, then of course people can think, well, where else do I look? and can look in different places. Mm. That's why, of course, the unions and the TUC umbrella or individually have to send a clear message that they are working for the interest of their members and the majority of society, but they have to keep that ability to act independently. I mean, as far as any worker is concerned, then I would say join the trade union. It's better to be organised, but of course that doesn't mean that we wait for that moment. Acting collectively is better expressed in a union, but if you're in a workplace that isn't organised, you need an issue that's pressing right now, then you don't wait until your direct debit is set up or any that way. <laughs> How do you act collectively? You meet with the people you work with. You discuss with them about what are your key demands, which we've talked about here, that whatever happens in this period, that we keep our job, that we keep our paying conditions, you know, that those things aren't lost at the threat of coronavirus. So those simple demands of keeping your job, keeping your income, etc., whether you've been in a union for 20 years, 10 minutes, or not in a union, you still can act collectively in your own workplace to demand of the employer that you keep those. But of course, better then that those workers are drawn into the trade union mm. movement. And of course, at the moment, it's quite a confused picture because, of course, people are weary of meeting together, if you like, you know, because of the threat... And it's a real threat. Although it can be uh, done electronically up to a point. Exactly. Well, well like, exactly. And of course, many of those young people, ironically, who are not necessarily in a union, perhaps don't even know at this stage what a union is. However, they're very savvy on social media, on the different platforms. I bet there are many workplaces that there's no sign of a trade union, but everyone's on a WhatsApp group. Well, if you wanted, outside the unions at the moment, some of the instinctive collective action of working class people is even to a degree some of these next-door neighbour groups that have sprung up on a street-by-street basis. The solidarity networks. Yes, in order initially to look in at providing, ensuring, you know, shopping and foods provided for elderly or vulnerable people in their streets. But look how quickly those have been organised, with sometimes, you know, a thousand or more being organised within a space of a couple of days of groups of people to get together. That collective instinct... It is of workers to seek to get together. I think there's another issue with the unions that they've got to be wary of, in my view. It's not just simply that they enter into neutrality with the bosses, but it's actually that they almost go into a bit of a silent mode at Mm. the moment, behind a little bit, to be honest with you, of that we can't have meetings, you can't meet together, etc. That in some workplaces, we're hearing reports of workers desperate to get hold of their union to meet, to plan, even around health and safety stuff. And literally, the response of some of the unions in some areas has been, oh, well, we can't have stewards' meetings because we're not allowed to meet together. So they, in effect, shut down. And that is a real danger, equally, in my view, that the unions cannot be seen to demobilise at the very most important time. And they have to be at the forefront 
of being seen to be able to take up workers' issues, to be able to defend their communities and to be seen. Can I just say as well and add to that that obviously I'm also the national chair of the National Shop Stewards Network and we produce a weekly bulletin that goes out to thousands in the trade union movement and in so-called normal times that's, and it will still do, you know, tells workers about the different disputes that are taking place around. And by the way, those disputes are still taking place. This week we've saw three days of strike action in St Mungo's, that was in charity. We've also seen, obviously, the... That was an interesting picket line, by the way, because they were at a safe distance <laughs> from each other on the picket line. Yeah, so we're, <laughs> workers are prepared to act flexibly and take initiative. <laughs> But then, of course, we saw that fantastic action yesterday done in Bexley by the bin workers. So we'll continue to spread the word about the different disputes. But, of course, you know, we also are totally aware of the role that the NSSN can play in this coronavirus crisis. To coordinate and, things. Yeah, and like we've produced, we produced a model motion that trade union members can take in their union branches, but we've produced it as a bulletin, and it's almost acting now as a bit of an idea, really, what issues and demands that workers can take up in their workplaces. And, and the yeah. Socialist Party, by the way, also has a workers' charter for the coronavirus, yeah. which incorporates some of the same points. Yeah, and it's dead useful, that charter. It's really good. You know, the Socialist Party has produced that material that people can take and available online and... You can request it from our website, which yeah. is socialistparty.org.uk. Yeah, it's, it's fantastic. Certainly from an NSSN point of view, what we're going to do is is that, you know, we've got our social media platforms as well. You know, we've got a Facebook group. So we want to open that up, really, so that workers can tell each other about some of the things that are happening in their workplace. If you like, I'm sure we will have bus drivers from different parts of the country or workers in the public sector or different sectors saying... You might not have heard, but this has happened to us. We want you to know about it. Or as anyone else, you know, what are the rules on layoff pay? You know, what are the situation on that? So we want to use the NSSN, really. Open it up. Use it as a forum where workers can come to tell each other about what's going on. Ask for advice. Seek support, etc. We think that's going to be a very valuable resource as a worker way through this crisis. But, of course, the important task as well is to give workers confidence that, as Glenn said, the union movement doesn't lay down in this period. You know, we've got to make sure that the labour and trade union movement is absolutely prominent. It's in the forefront of workers' minds. Because when you talked about earlier, James, about, you know, even if you're not in a union, well, what an opportunity for the union. Mm. What an opportunity for the union movement to show that it is not just relevant, but itself is an essential service for all workers, whether they're organised or unorganised, that being part of the union movement is an important step to take in building that collective strength to take on the bosses who have not declared a truce in reality. Mm. And if we don't fight for ourselves, then they will use this crisis Mm. and any other crisis, including what can happen with the economy at this time, to take back yet more gains that workers have won in the last period. So I suppose in summary, it's really important that workers understand that the attacks which may come down the line from the state and from the employers, that you don't have to lie down and take them, that actually you can respond to them. Whether or not there is a trade union currently present in your workplace, you can organise collectively with your colleagues, withdraw your labour if necessary, if it means that you're going to improve the safety of your workplace in terms of your finances and in terms of health and safety during the epidemic, that you should join a union that you should get on to Facebook and search National Shop Stewards Network and find a Facebook group there to bring your experiences in so that they can be coordinated among rank-and-file trade unionists and workers organising across the country. That You should request the Workers' Charter from socialistparty.org.uk and that in the demands we're putting forward in this situation, we have to remember... But the past decade of the Tories saying it's impossible to nationalise, it's impossible to provide state aid, that's all out the window. We have to demand what is really necessary from public ownership, from additional resources, from requisitioning and so on. We have to demand it now because they've shown that they're willing to give it and under pressure they will give it. So let's apply that pressure. Absolutely. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Glenn. No problem. Socialism is produced by the Socialist Party, the England and Wales section of the Committee for Workers International. This week we heard from Glenn Kelly and Rob Williams, speaking to James Ivans, and I'm Scott Jones. 
Workers can share their experiences, help coordinate the fight back, and ask for advice in the National Shop Stewards Network Facebook group. You can find further reading on this episode in the episode notes in your podcast app and at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash podcast. For the latest statements on working class demands, socialist analysis, and reports from the front line, check the Socialist Party's website, socialistparty.org.uk, and our Facebook page. And if you have comments, questions, or something you want to hear from us, contact us on Socialism Podcast at socialistparty.org.uk. If you agree with the policies and actions the Socialist Party is fighting for, we need you. Join our campaign to build a truly effective, socialist, working class fighting force for the trade union labour movement. Join the Socialist Party now. Send us your details at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash join. If you live outside England and Wales and want to fight for socialism in your country, if you live outside England and Wales and want to join the fight for socialism in your country, contact the Committee for Workers International by visiting socialistworld.net. Help us spread the word by giving us a five-star review and subscribing so you don't miss out. Don't forget to recommend us to your co-workers and friends. Socialism, the podcast, has no wealthy backers. We survive thanks to the financial support of ordinary working class and young people, and we're proud of the political independence that gives us. If you like what you hear, help us take the fight to big business. You can make a regular donation or a one-off payment at socialistparty.org.uk forward slash donate. Till next time, solidarity.